It looks like the hottest hot tub you could possibly yeah, you have. Don't, you don't want to jump in there. No, no, no. <laughs> what is the future of energy? What is the future of nuclear power? I've once again flown halfway across the world to try to find a possible answer to that question. In the unassuming building behind me, Copenhagen Atomics, who thinks that the solution to all of our problems might be molten salt, enough to power the world. Copenhagen Atomics is a startup company that wants to bring a new technology to market. Uh, that new technology is best explained as thorium, molten salt reactors. It's a type of nuclear reactors that has huge potential compared to classical nuclear reactors. The long-term goal for the company is to mass manufacture these reactors uh, on assembly lines and make at least one reactor every day. Mass producing nuclear reactors? One every single day? What are molten salt reactors? And how could they possibly scale like this? Most nuclear reactors in the world look like this. Fuel rods filled with uranium pellets placed in a certain orientation so that neutrons from fission events continue a chain reaction, producing heat. This reactor is suffused with water, which both keeps the fuel from getting too hot and helps keep the chain reaction going by slowing neutrons down to suitable speeds. Water that gets hot in the reactor is then moved past colder water in a separate loop, transferring heat by simple thermodynamics. This heat is used to make some of the water steam, and that steam is used to turn turbines, generating electricity. The end goal of so-called molten salt reactors is the same. Make hot stuff that heats up gas to turn turbines. It's inside the reactor where the goals diverge. There are still control rods, but instead of fuel rods filled with uranium pellets, you have liquid uranium fuel dissolved in a molten salt. This circulating salt carries on a chain reaction that produces heat, again like a regular reactor, but because the fuel is a liquid, it can be moved in and out of the reactor. Surrounding all of this is another layer of radioactive liquid that actually turns into more uranium fuel as it's exposed to neutrons from the core. But we'll get to that later. Today's episode is sponsored by Radiocode. Gamers, I'm award-winning science educator and Nuke Hemsworth, Kyle Hill. As of the filming of this video, I am one of the only people in the world to be fortunate enough to explore the three major nuclear disaster sites. The equipment that I've brought with me to each of those sites? The sponsor of today's video, Radiocode. Radiocode makes pocket-sized radiation detectors and spectrometers, engineered specifically for science enthusiasts like you and me. Each Radiocode has an isotope identifier, spectrum analyzer, can overlay radiation rates on Google Maps, provides energy and temperature compensated dose rates and spectrums, has a food contamination testing mode, and has a mobile and PC app with awesome features like spectrograms, search, events lists, and more. One of my new favorite things to do is track how radiation increases depending on elevation. So I bring my radio code on every flight I take to watch background radiation rates increase by tens to hundreds of times. It really helps put some of the topics we talk about here in proper context. And if you're watching this video, you're probably the kind of person radio code makes these sleek devices for. Go to the link in the description and or the comments, use my code Kyle to get 10% off and support our nerdy work here. So why don't you get yourself a radio code and be ready to cesium the day? <laughs> As you can see, molten salt reactors are more complicated, but with that added complexity comes added benefits. Because the liquid uranium fuel is mobile, it can be cleaned outside of the reactor, cleaned of the fission products that normally accumulate in the fuel of traditional reactors. This means that the fuel in a molten salt reactor can be used until most of the fissile material is used up, dramatically extending the life of the fuel and by surrounding the reactor with transmutable material, a molten salt reactor could also, in theory, generate more fuel than it uses. Again, increasing efficiency. You might be wondering, why molten salt and not regular water? It sounds a lot harder to work with. Well, it is. But don't let the language here fool you. Molten salt is a lot more like water than you think. So first of all, when you dissolve your nuclear fuel in the salt, it's a little bit like putting salt in water. 
when you put the salt in there, salt water, you can't see the salt in there. It's the same if you dissolve uranium or thorium in a salt. It, it's also, you can't see it, it's just part of the, now it's not water, it's called salt, but uh, That was really surprising to me. I had thought that molten salt was going to be this hot, viscous liquid like lava, but it's not. And that's the whole reason this design works. So the purpose of this test or demo is to show the uh, sort of the viscosity of the molten salt. This is a sodium chloride table salt. Table salt. Yeah, and uh, there's uh, like uh, 30 liters or something in there, and we will stir around it in a little bit to see the viscosity and see the color. I think right now it's at 850 degrees Celsius, so I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Yeah, so I think uh, going into this, if I was to think what molten salt would look like and be like, I think a lot of people would think maybe it's, uh, myself included, more of like a slushy, like a hmm. slurry. Slushy. Yeah, <laughs> but I think what makes, what people don't know and what makes this technology really work is that at this temperature, molten salt, the viscosity is like water, so you can actually pump it around like water, and it's not this grainy, kind of sandy kind of mixture. Yeah. Well, let's see it for ourselves. Yeah, let's uh, take a look at this. Whoa. Whoa. So now it's the time to uh, bend back slightly. See, there's a crust on the top. Yeah. Already from the but there's almost no resistance. It is. It is like water. Yeah, it's like water. You see, it sticks onto the pin because the pin is. Uh, oh cold. yeah. It's uh, cold, so it freezes instantly when it touches. What? <laughs> That's like. It looks like deceptively dangerous, right? It looks like the hottest hot tub you could possibly yeah, have. You don't want to jump in there. No, no, no. <laughs> wow, that is fast. I, I, I would have bet money that it was more like lava when you're stirring it, but I, I, would have, I, I would have never expected that. Molten salt reactors are designed to work at much higher temperatures than typical nuclear reactors. This allows for the liquefaction of salts, which again, unlike regular reactors, can both be the coolant and the fuel. So instead of a pressurized water reactor that keeps its fuel in one place, where it builds up fission products and becomes less efficient over time, a molten salt reactor is constantly circulating fuel around the reactor, removing fission products as it does so. This is the key feature that could change the nuclear economy. Uranium-233 doesn't exist in nature, it's, uh, it's, it must be made inside nuclear reactors and, and then it's consumed right away in that process and, and converted into energy. Uh, but that process from thorium to uranium-233 in thermal spectrum is really efficient. So it's an opportunity to get nuclear energy at much lower cost. And working at the melting point of salts, these reactors can get better thermodynamic efficiency. A lot better. So the reason why we want to put the fuel in the salt is because that allows us to remove the fission product, which is the sort of the exhaust from the, from the energy creation process. And those fission products are very, very reactive. And if you can remove those from the salt, you can get much better fuel economy. That means your reactor will be smaller and you, the, the price of the energy will be, will be lower. So that's sort of the, the core idea of behind having molten salts. I've said before that nuclear power seems complicated, but at the end of the day, it's just spicy rocks making steam. Molten salt reactors are more complicated, but in theory, they can share a similar simplicity. There's some physics, but it's really not a lot because most of this was like figured out in the 40s and 50s. So it's like, at most, it's applied science. And uh, I would usually call it like uh, red hot plumbing because it's just pipes and pumps and uh, yeah, a little bit of a special sauce from the nuclear material. But in the end, it's just plumbing. The key to Copenhagen Atomics reactors, the whole reason why I flew to Denmark, is the kind of molten salt that they're using. It's based on an element named after the Norse god of thunder, the element I'm asked about when it comes to nuclear reactors more than any other, thorium. Thorium is a naturally occurring, slightly radioactive metal discovered in 1828 by the Swedish chemist Jans Jakob Berzelius. It was discovered to be radioactive decades later, in 1898 by Carl Schmitt, and in 1899 by Marie Curie. 
In fact, it was the second radioactive element ever discovered, after uranium, in 1896. Thorium has an incredibly long half-life of 14 billion years, roughly the age of the observable universe, and so is only weakly radioactive via alpha radiation. It's not very radioactive, and it's not fissile, or splittable like uranium-235 is. So why have scientists looked to thorium as a potential power source since the 60s? Well, the only natural isotope of thorium, thorium-232, isn't fissile or able to continue on nuclear chain reactions, but it can be made to be. Physicists figured out that if you could cram an extra neutron into the nucleus of thorium-232, it would become thorium-233 and then decay twice by firing off electrons. The first stop on the decay chain is protactinium-233 and then uranium-233. Uranium-233 is fissile and can in theory be used in nuclear reactors just like uranium-235 or plutonium-239. And if you build the reactor in the right way, with more of this so-called fertile thorium-232 around, the neutrons that fly out after the fission of uranium-233 can start this chain all over again. If only alchemists of old could see what we can do today. If this all sounds a lot more complicated than simply enriching uranium and putting it in a reactor, it is. But thorium as a power source has huge potential benefits. First of all, it's significantly more abundant in Earth's crust. It's one of the most abundant heavy elements, almost as abundant as lead. In fact, thorium is so abundant that its radioactive decay is the largest single contributor to the Earth's internal heat. Even if it wasn't as common as it is, thorium can also make more fissile fuel. This ability in nuclear circles, shown in the decay chain we just went through, is called breeding. What is breeding technically? It's where you produce more fuel than you consume. So that can seem sort of counterintuitive, but it comes from the fact that you need one neutron to drive the chain reaction, but every fission event gives you a bit more than two neutrons. So you basically have more than one neutron spare that you can utilize. And then in our case, we utilize that extra neutron to make new fuel. And that fuel then goes on to... Make new fuel, fuel. yeah, yeah. Well, you get to that point where you produce just the most fuel as you need, and then you can go a few percent beyond that, and then you're in like the, the realm of compounding interest. If you can make a thorium reactor work, it will both be generating energy and making its own fuel. So the design has obvious economic advantages too. In molten salt reactors, you can get to a, a very special situation where you can make a breeder reactor in what is called thermal spectrum. That's a, some jargon for a nuclear engineering saying that you slow down the neutrons. Uh, that means that you can make the reactor smaller, you need uh, less fuel. That's something about the nuclear engineering. But in general, the, the reactor becomes uh, uh, really efficient when you can use slow neutrons or thermal neutrons. Recall that thorium reactors don't have static fuel. It's molten. It's circulating. So not only can it be efficient in that it creates its own fuel, by design, a molten salt reactor has the ability to actively remove the fission products that build up in typical reactor fuel bundles, increasing the efficiency of the fuel itself. In classical reactors, the fuel needs to be replaced every two years because it, it sort of runs out because it's full of fission products. But in our case, we can use the fuel for 100 years because it, we can remove the fission products from the fuel while we're running. So it's completely different, right? Our fuel lasts for a long time, but our metal components only last for five years. It's completely the opposite for their reactors. By actively removing the pollutants that shorten the working life of fuel in other reactors, thorium molten salt reactors would produce less nuclear waste, and that waste would be less toxic. China. The only country that is reportedly poised to commercialize molten salt reactors estimates that the hazardous waste production with thorium will be a thousand times less than with uranium, eliminating the need for large scale and or long term storage. The radioactivity of this waste would drop to safe levels in just a few hundred years instead of many thousands. Another potential benefit. If China is successful, they are in an incredible position to capitalize on thorium technology. Used optimally, one ton of thorium might produce as much energy as 200 tons of uranium, or three and a half million tons of coal. International experts also estimate, 
China doesn't disclose these things, that China has one of the largest thorium reserves in the world, enough to generate the entire nation's energy needs for the next 20,000 years. A potential thorium dynasty, if you will. If a thorium molten salt reactor could in theory be smaller, more efficient, cheaper, easier to mass produce, produces its own fuel, produces less nuclear waste, and is harder to weaponize because of the fuel that it uses, why isn't there a single operating commercial reactor of this kind in the world? That's a good question. A question that people have been asking for 60 years now. A question for part two. Until next time.